Hi everyone, this is John Pater speaking, and today I'd like to speak about spiritual and physical evolution. But before I get onto that, and indeed it is a very deep topic, why is it important to know of spiritual and physical evolution? We haven't really needed to know about evolution, up until now that is. And from a certain perspective, this was not even really known until recently. Well, at least not amongst everybody. Now, I'll just use an analogy and let's say we choose to live in a flood zone. That is where floods occur that can be damaging to our houses. Now we can choose to or not know about it, or we can become aware of it, but do nothing about it, and just accept what comes. Or we become aware of it, and we take preventive actions to reduce the effects of a future flood, as we now have the knowledge and resources to do this. So by learning about evolution, we get to know what will happen to humanity. And we can then also know and take preventive actions once we are aware of what to do, especially when there are negative events coming towards us. Okay, so what is the problem today? Humanity has reached a position where truth has become uncertain. Many of my friends will say this or that, they can be totally opposite. When I try to engage in conversations, sometimes people deny simple logic. So truth is all over the place. Sometimes we might have authorities based on YouTube or social media as the main authorities for people, whereas previously they were research scientists who spent many years of research and testing and writing papers and presenting information. But sometimes YouTube authorities overrule. So this must inevitably lead to the collapse of our social forms and these will re be replaced by cruel autocratic systems unless we can meet these events with knowledge of spiritual evolution and then take appropriate action previously we just reincarnated and life was just taken care of with the help of our spiritual guiding beings we experienced good karma, bad karma, made decisions, etc. But now, since we have evolved to the point where we are now capable and of advancing the previous work of our spiritual guiding beings, hmm, but now we are capable and are also required to advance the previous work of our spiritual guiding beings. Just to give one example, we are now required to consciously create the social forms of our society, otherwise severe repression and suffering will follow, and this has already started. Previously spiritual beings formed our social life through guiding nations, through unconscious impulses for leaders, uh, leaders, religious leaders, etc. But this is not going to happen anymore. Any guidance that comes will be from another source and it won't be um, palatable to human beings. So without human conscious participation, we are going to be a little bit in trouble. Now look and see what's happening with Russia, China, Myanmar and Venezuela and also many of the Eastern, Middle Eastern nations. Some of these have fairly repressive regimes. 
Some of you may agree with them, um, but many people suffer through these regimes and this is not going to abate. It's going to spread over the world as people become unruly, um, demand more things, have different versions of truths, come into conflict with the authorities. So soon these repressive regimes will come about. And guess who will be at fault? Us for not taking action, for not knowing about what we can do. I don't mean to go out in the street and all that, but I mean, what can we do spiritually about it? Through knowledge of the past, our present conditions become comprehensible. Through knowledge of the potential future, we can become filled with enthusiasm to consciously transform the world through actions, as we now know the reasons as to why events have happened and why we should act in a particular way. Now, to give an overall picture of the purpose of the earth. Now, if I take a previous incarnation of the earth, which was called Old Moon, we can talk about its mission. What was its mission? Its mission was the cosmos of wisdom. When it started, there was no wisdom. When it finished, there was wisdom and we have the fruits of it. Look how through nature, wisdom is woven through every aspect of nature. Look at our fiber. Look how little material it is made of for the greatest strength. Look at paper being made by wasps. Look at the wisdom that goes into that. So this now, we have the fruits of our previous incarnation of the earth. Now this is of the earth. But what is the mission of the earth? The mission of the earth is to become the cosmos of love. And this is to come through by human beings. Yes, we are one with the earth. We will die and we will come back to meet whatever we have created. So the earth and human beings are one. We are both evolving. Now there's also a saying, as above, so below, and as below, so above. This saying has to do with the effects from the spiritual world onto the physical world and vice versa. The two realms are interrelated, but we are generally only aware of the physical sense realm with our perceptions. However, we can say that awareness, in awareness, both these aspects exist as part of awareness. But I'm going to primarily focus only on these aspects from the aspect of duality when I speak about evolution. Now, we can talk about what is the purpose of humanity from awareness. We can talk about that it is absolute happiness. And if we're able to align absolute happiness with also the purpose of what the cosmos wants us to do, then we're in harmony. And its higher meaning is really only dimly comprehended today. And it's more like a feeling, absolute happiness. We know what egotistical happiness is, but we're talking about this divine happiness. So if we align our tasks to better the earth, to take an interest and to take an active role in its evolution, then we actually achieve absolute happiness because we become one with the mission of the earth. However, as you can be aware of, evolution gives us a perspective from the I thought perspective, which we can clearly comprehend. And so as we evolve further, the deeper meaning of absolute happiness will become apparent even to the I thought. 
So to give an example, when you practice to abide in self, one will gain a mastery of the random thoughts that arise. We really should be grateful to these random thoughts before we practiced consciously. These random thoughts gave us our eye thought, gave us our direction in life. And we just sort of participated, dimly aware of this. But as soon as we practiced to abide in self, we became aware that many of our thoughts were random. We couldn't control it. But through mastery of these random thoughts, when we're able to let them arise only when we give permission, and otherwise they won't arise. The same with feelings, and the same with external interruptions when you're in that state of abidance. So you can see that by practicing to abide in self, you are already evolving. You're changing yourself with into or acquiring capacities which you didn't have before. However, even in abiding in self, we really gain very little mastery over our life functions. You know, the growth of our organs, the interrelationships of our organs. And in fact, we may not even be conscious of our organs, nor of our physical body. So we've got a long way to go. We will be with the earth until we gain full mastery right down to the physical body. And we could have a roadmap. We can know how we got here from the past and where we're going to in the future. So we can know our goal. Do we want to align ourselves to what's been put in front of us? It's up to us. Because we've got one unique quality that is nowhere in the cosmos. And that's called freedom. We've got the potential to be free. Even an understanding of freedom is so difficult to understand that why were we cut off from awareness or those divine guiding beings behind us? Why did we get cut off from that? Why do we only see this dead matter? They're questions, they're valid questions, but we did. That was so we could gain freedom. So even these mighty beings, our creator beings, the very chairs we're sitting on, the very soil that our houses are on at the moment, the very material that's all around us, these beings that created all this substance for us, they're still not free. Only human beings will have the potential for freedom. When I'm saying will, we have very little into freedom. Most of what we do is already predetermined, but we have a little spark of freedom and this has to grow. And it's beyond the scope of this talk to say why, but just to give you an experience that we're also on a mission for freedom. Because if it's to become the cosmos of love, how can you love when you don't have freedom? If you're told to love, is that love? And I'll give you a little example, something beautiful and pure, but it's not free. You look at mother, mother and child. Look at the love the mother has for the child. Now, I'm sure most of you will agree that this love just arises. It's overflowing love. It comes from somewhere, but it's not necessarily yourself. To freely love, or to love in the true sense of the word, in the ultimate sense, means absolute freedom that you choose to love. Something to think about. So humanity had to go into a state from its, when it was created, into a state of ignorance. We fell into ignorance. And this is also called 
in the Jewish, Muslim, Christian Bible, the temptation. This was our journey into freedom. Now, there's a price for this as well. We became separated. We became separated from awareness. Was it worth it? Should we just say, no, no, I don't like this and I don't want to reincarnate anymore? Or can we say, I will gladly reincarnate? Now, I want to take an example of a person here, Anil, who has as his guiding beings Ramana and Beniswa Junov, or the Rishi. They have not left influence in the earth. Their mission is to help humanity. So even though they may have achieved a higher level of awareness, they're still with the earth. They will still suffer. They will still feel pain. In different ways, of course. They will sacrifice themselves to be with the earth to help its evolution. Or there is another choice, because in freedom, if you're free, you can escape from this earth, you can escape totally from this evolutionary cycle. But there's a price you will pay in the far distant future for that as well, which I can speak about later. So you can see that this topic of evolution is extremely complex. Now, I just want to show you a little bit. I'm going to put a share a screen up of the chart of our evolution. Not really to discuss it, but just to sort of show you its complexity. Now, if you actually have a look at this chart, and you can actually just have a look at where we came from. Our first beginnings was a cosmos or a planetary condition. The first planetary condition of the Earth, or the first incarnation, was called Old Saturn. Our physical body came into being. The next incarnation was called Old Sun. We received life. And the next incarnation was Old Moon. The cosmos of wisdom that was achieved there. And on Earth, well, look at the complexity of something of a planetary existence. We've got many states called Polarian, Hyperborean, Lemurian, Atlantean, Post-Atlantean. We're in that at the moment. And then we can divide it further. The ancient Indian culture, which was about 8,000 years ago, the ancient Persian, the Egyptian, Chaldean, the greco of Roman. We've got the present and we'll have the sixth and seventh. And so we'll go into two more epochs before the Earth incarnation ceases. And then we'll have a new cosmos. It's called Jupiter, whatever one will call it. And that'll be the future incarnation of the Earth. And the next future incarnation after that will be called Venus. On Jupiter, we will develop a principle called Manus where we would have transformed our astral body, become so conscious. We're on the way when we abide in self. We take control of the random thoughts, just a little bit of an aspect of an astral body. But on Jupiter, we will have that principle. On Venus, we will develop buddhi, life spirit, where we gain mastery over our life forces our circulation, our breathing, whatever you may call it, but will be totally different. Because on the Venus state, there'll be no longer um, a solid Earth. It'll be totally different, totally unlike of what you can imagine, but there still will be physicality. And on Vulcan, finally, those who have made it, those who've worked through it, will become masters of their whole being, including their physical body. This is called Atma, the stage of Atma. Now, there are always people who are ahead of the general population, so as to guide human beings. But we are eventually required to do all this work ourselves. 
So thank you for that. Just wanted to give you a brief overview. And it is indeed complex and there are further, much further detailed discussions to continue should you be interested. Thank you.